All right, hello, hello everyone. Uh, today, uh, Leonard and I will be uh, Leonard and I will be speaking about how we can uh, get a bit more diversity in the WebRTC ecosystem, and how alternative WebRTC implementations will help us to achieve this goal. So I'm Jeremy, I'm the CTO of Spasinov. I've been involved in free software since 2000 and uh, actively using Python since 2007. And today, um, my, let's say my perspective on this is as the author of AIO RTC, a uh, Python implementation of WebRTC. So uh, hi everyone from me as well. I'm Leonard Graal. I do enjoy network programming. So, um, Okay, fine. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Leonard Graal, as I said. I do enjoy network probing, programming. Um, I am the author of Raw RTC, which is a, well, partial web RTC implementation, and of Salty RTC, which is an end to end encrypted signaling solution. I am apparently a W3C uh, web RTC invited expert, and I do work for Threema when I don't work on my personal projects. So uh, WebRTC, uh, in, in, in short, is, uh, is about secure peer-to-peer -peer communications, whether you're exchanging audio, video, or data. And if you've made use of, web, of, of WebRTC, you most likely have made use of the WebRTC.org code base, which is a, a project which is driven by Google and which serves as the de facto reference implementation for WebRTC. Um, it is, it's a code base which is widely used by browsers. Uh, Chrome uses it extensively. Firefox also uses it, at least for the, the media part, less so for, for data channels. And with Edge converging towards Chromium, well, you know, you know it, uh, Edge will be using the, the same stack too. Uh, Web, the WebRTC.org code base deserves a lot of credit because it has put WebRTC into the hands of millions of, of people. So we probably wouldn't be talking about WebRTC today if there wasn't the WebRTC.org code base. <laughs> Nevertheless, if you've tried to integrate this code base into your own custom project, so we're probably speaking outside the, the, the browser space, um, you will probably have noticed that this is a massive project and uh, integrating it is hard. Tracking releases is also quite a, quite a challenge. And to give you a ballpark figure about what I mean by a large project, uh, here is a recent tweet um, by someone who should know. So Justin said it's weighing in at 1.2 million lines of code. So I don't know how many of you have written that kind of code, but I have not. Um, and so. What can we do, start, starting from here? Do you have any other choices if you want, to, if you want a library which supports uh, WebRTC for your own project? The answer is luckily yes. So we're going to talk about two different, uh, two, uh, two different libraries. Uh, um, for, for my part, I'm going to talk about AIO RTC. It is a, a WebRTC implementation which is written in Python. It leverages uh, the modern Python support for async I.O. It supports audio, video, and data channels, so it's got you pretty well covered. And weighing in at around 6,000 lines of code, it is uh, much more pleasurable to hack on, and we're um, lucky enough to have reached uh, full test coverage on it. it, it start, AIO RTC started its life as a testing tool for the, um, to test the availability of a of my company's WebRTC endpoint, and it has grown significantly since there. As a Python project, one of the, one of the um, key selling points is that you can tap into the broad Python ecosystem. For, the, for its audio and video frames, AIO RTC relies on the PyAV project's uh, audio and video frames. Uh, this is a binding to FFmpeg, so this gives you a lot of power, whether it's in terms of reading media from various sources, whether they, these are MP4 files or, or an RTSP stream, uh, it's got you covered. And it also gives you a lot of possibilities in how uh, you output this, uh, these media streams. 
Python, the Python ecosystem also gives you lots of options when it comes to building, to building the um, signaling solutions. Uh, you have modules such as AIO, HTTP, and WebSockets, uh, which are very handy. And you also have lots of options if you want to do things like uh, image processing uh, or even machine learning with projects such as OpenCV and TensorFlow. It's easy to feed these media streams uh, or the frames of these media, uh, media streams into these projects. Okay. Um, AIO RTC comes with a, a growing collection of uh, examples built, built right into it. So on the left here, what we have is uh, streaming Big Buck Bunny from an MP4 file into the AppRTC demo, uh, demo website. Uh, so this is something you can do with zero lines of code. There's an example for that built in. And on the right hand side is an example where uh, the browser is talking to um, a Python based server which handles both signaling and media which applies some real-time uh, processing on the video frames and sends them back to you, in this case, with a, with a cartoon kind of effect. What are some of the use cases for AIO RTC? Uh, on the data channels side, you can, you can uh, use data channels, for example, to communicate with embedded devices, or you can have some more esoteric use cases, such as running a, a VPN over data channels and so benefiting from the... Um, firewall punching uh, features of WebRTC. There's an example for that on, on GitHub. Um, there's also quite a, a wide range of applications which involve media processing or maybe machine learning. You can do things like uh, real-time feature extraction on the, or recognition on video streams. Um, I, we had, I've had some users uh, report they wanted to use AIO RTC for a central server which would record uh, video streams coming from mobile devices, or if you want, you can also uh, build your own solution to securely access your home, uh, your home surveillance cameras on the go from your um, from your mobile device. And obviously, this is Python. So one of the the strengths of Python is how expressive the language is and how quickly you can prototype uh, you can prototype solutions using Python. The syntax will be very familiar for anyone who has used WebRTC. You're going to find your usual RTC peer, RTC peer connection. And thanks to Python's support for async await, well, you just, uh, you, you just do your create offers and set local descriptions as usual. What's unusual is that you have some higher level, higher level objects, such as a media player and a media recorder, which allow you to either read or write um, your media streams. Now, what if you're operating in a really constrained environment and Python's not even an option for you? Do you have any good solutions for that? Perhaps I do. Um, mm -hmm. So raw RTC is another alternative uh, implementation, but it's, it only supports data channels, so it's a little bit specialized. It is intended to be resource friendly, so you can use it in embedded devices as well. It does use two libraries underneath, which is RE and user SCDP. And um, I originally created it in 2016 for testing purposes as well. So my former professor, Michael Tuxen, uh, wanted to have a tool to showcase, uh, well, data channels and um, test and improve the data channel implementations without having to work with or untangle all the existing um, browsers implementations, such as the one used by Chrome or Firefox. So. Okay, sure. Uh, C was a requirement, so uh, I wrote it in C. And um, well, yeah, as we as I said, we use it to to test a couple of things in the in the data channel in implementations, and it was being used to um, patch the EOR problem, which is also known as message integrity violation. Um, and then we backported that to Firefox, and there were a couple of other improvements where we did the same thing. So we also uh, tested throughput of the data channels and then backported the, the necessary changes to, to Firefox. So of course you can, since it's now an existing implementation, you can also use it for your own use cases, such as uh, applications and services. So one of the things that uh, I have seen that uh, seem to be of interest is um, integrating it into an existing torrent library to implement a web torrent. 
Another example I've seen is um, some people seem to be interested in uh, doing peer-assisted CDNs, which are just CDNs which are being, um, well, where you reduce the peak load by sending um, data via peer-to-peer. -peer. And you, you could use raw RDC for that. But then there are, of course, also the embedded use cases, such as uh, using it for, well, we've used it for RC toys, so we've uh, made an example where you can uh, control the LEGO Mindstorms robot with it, and it worked fine. But also IoT use cases are, are in it as well, if there is a little bit of power on the device. So, yeah. For example, exterior, interior illumination, and yeah. Furthermore, you can uh, integrate it into an existing web RDC implementation. If you don't have a data channel stack yet, this might be interesting. So if you have ICE and DTLS, for example, in, in a selective forwarding unit, then you can integrate raw RDC into it so you can use data channels as well. <coughs> this is one of the, the demos we wrote. So this is, on the right side, we, we see a, a browser that just opens multiple terminals and yeah, it just accesses the, the local terminal on, on, on that device using, by using raw RTC, which is kind of fun since you can punch through the, the net and yeah, just access your, your device without having to forward any ports. So in the, um, in the process of uh, producing these two alternative WebRTC implementations, um, we encountered a number of, of uh, common problems or had some uh, thoughts, thoughts about this and which we wanted to share with you. First of all, what are the challenges if, you're, if you decide that you want to spin your own WebRTC implementation? Personally, the first, the first problem was finding the relevant documentation because documentation is spread out across let's say two different worlds, the IETF world and the W3C world. And so you have to hunt down all the, the RFCs or possibly even draft RFCs and then uh, refer back to the W3C specs for WebRTC. And try and wrap your mind, trying to wrap your mind around all this is quite challenging. So I think we're maybe missing a sort of single entry point um, which would refer to these different documents and give us a, a better overview of the, you know, all the relevant specifications. The second challenge is that uh, when implementing a WebRTC stack is that this is a deep stack uh, which uh, involves a number of layers and it's only getting bigger. You already have to, you already need to deal with things like network connectivity at the ICE level, then through encryption using uh, encryption key derivation with, for using DTLS, um, RTP and SRTP and RTCP for the, for the media streams. And uh, on the data channel side, well, you need an SCTP stack. Now, unfortunately for me, pretty much none of these building blocks existed in Python. They do now. Um, you can, and you, we, we, we agree that it's, uh, it's a good idea to spin these out into reusable modules so that if someone else wants to take a different approach on implementing this WebRTC stack, well, at least they have some of the, the basic building blocks to, to go on. Um, a similar point is how to structure your, your code. If you, uh, if you've manipulated WebRTC, let's say with a browser perspective, you're used to this very central RTC peer connection object. Um, and from there, it's kind of not very clear how you should structure your code. Luckily, ORTC, Object RTC, which is a sort of different approach on the same project, does break down this kind of monolithic, monolithic stack into some discrete objects and it provides some, some interesting guidance in how to structure your code. This was one of Leonard's tips early on when I, when I started implementing AIO RTC and I'm very grateful for it. Um, another issue you may run into is that you, you may run into parts of the specs which are ambiguous or maybe downright uh, downright wrong, and so uh, it may, it's challenging to contribute back to the W3C as uh, substantial contributions are only allowed for members. 
Now, there are a number of benefits to having alternative uh, WebRTC implementations. The most obvious for me is that a standard only lives up to its name if it has multiple implementers. So, in this sense, diversity is really a good thing. Um, also, well, these WebRTC implementations are a lot smaller than the WebRTC.org one. And personally, I find that a lot more fun to hack on and easier to integrate into custom projects. In the process of developing these uh, WebRTC stacks, we shook out a number of bugs in the, in the, in the browsers. And well, for the friendlier browsers, such as Firefox, it's been a pleasure to contribute to, to the development effort. Um, and having alternative WebRTC implementation also helps uh, give valuable feedback to the standardization process as you're able to prototype new features or possibly explore areas which were not originally envisioned in the, um, in, in the WebRTC scope. Okay, so now that we've heard about uh, the benefits of alternative implementations, so maybe there are areas where we can improve, and I think there are. Um, so one of the things is that browsers, browsers are still surprisingly far away from uh, spec um, well compliance. So if, if you want to get this changed, maybe it is the time to get involved. Um, there's another problem that is that the data channel lobby, I think, is underrepresented in the specification process. So um, which, which also brings me to the next point, which is um, how can we make the specification process maybe more transparent, maybe more visible, um, so we can involve developers and users to provide direct feedback instead of, you know, posting it, posting it on uh, Stack Overflow and then be, be done with it. Um, last but not least, from the feedback that we uh, get is that WebRTC is still misunderstood by developers, so some of them think it's mainly used for client-to-server, while it is actually mostly peer-to-peer. Um, there are, of course, use cases where you can use it for client server, but it's intended to be peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. And the purpose of the, the whole signaling process and how it, how it works, how the mechanics uh, work in the web RDC stack, they are uh, widely misunderstood. So we think the documentation could maybe be improved, for example, in the Mozilla developer network, but maybe we should also post new blog posts um, that update the existing ones because there are quite a lot of quite a lot that are well outdated and yeah so with that we thank you for listening um, we have listed some further alternative web RDC implementations there if you want to look at them um, yeah do you have any questions if we have some time left in the meantime I'm going to we're going to let this figure sink in, which is kind of the, the ratio between the, uh, the, the number of lines of code in webrtc.org and in AIORTC. Right. Yeah, so... Um, <laughs> for for AIORTC, uh, what are you using for congestion control for the media side? Uh, congestion control on the media side. At the moment, where there is, uh, I mean, congestion control is is implemented for data channels. That's part of the SCTP spec. Um, there, there is no congestion control per se on the media side. There is a receiver estimated um, maximum bandwidth, and so the the, the video codec, the video codec uh, do uh, the VP8 codec does respond to 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 this and will adjust its um, its bandwidth but I mean for audio for instance there's absolutely no provision for this either you have the bandwidth or you don't and communication breaks down I hope I answered the question <laughs> yes. last question a quick one otherwise you can meet the guys around here Dan, Dan. Oh. <coughs> quick one and loud. so I, I completely agree on documentation um, it sucks and the Mozilla developer network is just wrong 99% of the time when it comes to WebRTC which is a real shame um, so yeah we should all it's not really a question at all I, I'm completely agreeing with you uh, on, on that front um, I just want to talk about that 0 0.5 number um, you guys it, there's an awful lot of AV stuff in that SDK code base and it, it's, it's difficult to talk about a total number of lines when 
we're talking about transport and and encryption and AV. Um, and I don't want people to think that, oh, why is the Google one really, really big and yours is really, really small? They, they are definitely. This is just this very, is this is kind of being a bit cheeky, yeah. but um, still within the the six K the six K lines of code uh, that I mentioned, you do have a full ICE implementation uh, support for the D, for DTLS and all the way up to to receiver estimated uh, maximum maximum bandwidth. But still, I think that somewhere uh, for sure for sure AIO RTC does more than 0.5 percent of the of the features. I'm not claiming full feature parity. But still, there's a massive Pareto effect uh, going on here. And concerning documentation, um, on MDN you can you can contribute things such as uh, such as uh, you know uh, what browsers support which features. Uh, I've already uh, we've we've both done some some contributions and to this effect, and I encourage you to do the same. Thank okay, you. thank you. A lot of more people.